Welcome also to all those attending virtually. I am Deline Pretorius. I'm the Deputy Director for Academic Services at the Stellenbosch Library and Information Service. Um, this is the second session um, during which the first sub-theme of the symposium will be explored, and that is the changing landscape of higher education in research, teaching, and learning. We first have an in-person presenter, Sonia Silhier, then a virtual presenter, Professor Liz Lange, thirdly, an in-person presenter again, that will be Professor Dennis Ochola, and then lastly, we have time for discussion. Please keep your questions and comments for this discussion session, and also, um, please, um, state to whom you will be directing your question. And we hope, I hope you're gonna have a lively discussion to set the scene for the rest of the symposium. And then of course, to discuss further during lunch. Um, I just want to mention to the virtual delegates, um, if you want to ask a question or give a comment, you need to um, go to the Q and A and then click on the X. Okay, so um, Sonia Silier is our first speaker. She's going to present with her Stellenbosch Business School senior lecturer hat on. But it sounds as if she's going to swap it for a radio DJ hat at some stage. Please, Sonia, go ahead. We're looking forward to what you want to share with us. Thank you very much. Okay, um, hi everybody. I'm going to be just walking around and having a conversation with you. Um, let me just introduce myself. Uh, as, as you heard, my name is Sonia Silier and um, I am a finance lecturer of all things at the Stellenbosch University Business School. So let me just get my, there's my presentation. So um, just wanna share a few thoughts with you and how I've experienced the virtual teaching world over the last two years. So my first slide here, you can see this picture. It was taken uh, from my dining room table. And when, if, you know, those of you that are lecturing, I'm sure there's many out there. If you look at this picture, you are probably thinking, yes, this has pretty much been my life for the last two years. Um, trying to navigate two screens, some students with cameras on, some students with cameras off, some looking like they're sleeping, you're not sure who's awake. Um, maybe you're thinking, oh, she's, she's got two screens, she's lucky, I had to do it on one screen. Okay, so, you know, but I wanna tell you today that uh, what you see is not always what you get. What if I told you that what you were looking at here were a group of students from the, the South African Cape Town townsh townships, uh, a group of 30 students that were in their first class, first time using a laptop in their life. And this was the Monday, the start of a five week course where they had full day classes with me and a colleague. What if I told you that these students were enormously engaged, that they were so lively and so thirsty for knowledge that at the end of these five days, the main comment that we got was, I wish this course was longer. What if I told you that the day before this day, they had Excel training for the first times in their lives, and at the end of this course, they would be presenting us with a full set of financial statements, an income statement, balance sheet, and a cash flow statement in Excel based on their own businesses. What if I told you all of that? Does that change your mind as to what you're looking at? I think so. So at the USB, at the Stellenbosch Business School where I work, we are actually known, we were always known for our hybrid teaching methods. So we've always had a system of some students in class, some students online. But at the start of the pandemic, you know, we've got a lot of courses and some of our courses like this one were still very much old school, very much teacher classroom and we had to adapt quickly. This was taken in July 2020, just in the beginning of that lockdown period. And we were faced with a group of 30 students that had enrolled 
And we were faced, do we cancel the course or do we make a plan? So we made a plan. What we did is at the university, um, many of the staff members donated old laptops to the university. So we went, we, we, we tried to collect laptops. Then we, we drove out to the houses of these guys. We, got, we, bought, we lent them the laptops. We provided them with data packages, and this is the result of that. They came online, and we had a fantastic time. So we had to adapt, and we had to adapt quickly. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I teach to a lot of, a lot of different kinds of students. I teach to MBA students. I teach to township entrepreneurs. I teach to executives on our executive development program. So there's a lot of different people that I teach to. Um, and, but I teach finance. So... You know, many times when, when people, and I teach finance to people who are not finance versed many times. So when they walk into my class, they normally have a lot of fear. Okay, so that's the one subject they don't, they don't really like it. Um, case in point. Let me just move to, okay. So case in point. I want to share with you what I was doing last week, Monday. So last week, Monday, no, I mean, we are having a conversation. So I thought that you might get to know me a little bit. So last week, Monday, I was in hospital. Um, and I was awaiting surgery. So they told me that you had three hours to kill before going into your surgery. So bring a book. So this is the book I brought. So I was there. I was the only one that, that was a quiet day in the hospital. So I was the only one there um, waiting for you know, surgery. And I'm reading through my finance book, highlighting things, making notes, preparing for a, for a, uh, a course that I'm going to be teaching next year. And in walks this guy. And he, he is a, one of the hospital nurses. And he says, so my book is down. And he says, so what are you reading? And I hold up my book and he's like, oh, okay, no, um, that's not for me. And I laugh and I say, you know, you have the same reaction that many of my students have. So that's why I don't throw the book at them, literally. Um, so what I do, what I've been sitting here, and I show them this picture. And I said, what I've actually been doing is I've been taking the concepts in this book and I've been drawing a picture. And he looks at the picture and he says, oh, wait, I, I understand. And he says, you know what? This reminds me of my history teacher when I was at high school. I didn't see the point of doing history at high school, but I had this wonderful history teacher, and he used to draw pictures. So this nurse, he walks to the white wall next to us, and he starts finger drawing and reciting a picture from that his, his history teacher sh shared with him at school. And I'm amazed. I say, I can't believe you can remember all that. He says, I remember it to this day, and this opened up my love for history. And he says, you know what? You've just changed my mind about something else. I said, what is that? He said, when I saw that book, I was immediately walled off. But when you show showed me the picture, I was reminded of the fact that I can open my mind to new things. I said to him, you know what? This is exactly what I do. I am the curator of the information, and I want to give it to my students in a palatable way. So I draw pictures. I try and demystify the jargon. You know, so we had a, we had a lovely discussion. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today is, as a, as a lecturer in this virtual world, it really starts with you. And it's really about having a conversation. So like I said, having a conversation with me today, I think it's important that you, that you get to know me a little bit so that you can know what what motivates me when I talk to my students. And I think this is critical as we get to know ourselves in this virtual space. Right, so why am I in the hospital? Let's go back to that. So you, you're not gonna believe this, but what I was doing in hospital is I was having a chemotherapy port removed last week, Monday. So this was a happy day for me. I, um, you know, this was after a journey. 2018, I uh, got the shock of a cancer diagnosis, but this is now 2021. I'm having this port removed. It's a happy day for me. So how did this change my life? So I was a chartered accountant with two law degrees on my way to doing a master's and doctorate in finance. Then this thing hit me. Okay, so a lot of things hit many people during the pandemic. So I can relate to that. That's why I'm sharing the story with you because many of us have been faced with either sickness, death in families and death of our students. You know, we've been, we've been through an absolute um, hell the last two years. So I went through this and what it did for me in 2018 is I changed track. So instead of going to do that master's in finance, I ended up doing a master's in, you're not gonna believe it, philosophy. Right, hardcore lawyer, accountant, me. Um, master's in philosophy with a focus on coaching. So. How did that impact me? I just re realized that I, 
I want to spend my time wisely and I want to make sure that I share myself with my students in a way that can really impact them. And this coaching course has really changed my life. I'm actually going to do my PhD now in uh, emotional intelligence. Okay, emotional intelligence of auditors. So I'm going a bit back to the old accountant to me. I can't leave those guys behind. They, they really needed these auditors. <laughs> as you know from, <laughs> from all the accounting scandals. Okay, so, um, so that's a little bit about me. So I wanna tell you, if you're lecturing out there or if you're supporting lecturers, it starts with you, who are you? And then it's, it goes on and be, what is it about being curious about them, your students, your participants? Right, I wanna share something with you. One of the fathers of coaching, he said this, and you can look at the pictures, you don't even have to read the words, just look at the picture. That first picture is of an acorn. And the second one is of an oak tree. So Sir John Whitmore said the following thing. He said, we are more like acorns, each of which contains within it the potential to be a magnificent oak tree within that acorn. But this acorn, we need nourishment, encouragement, and the light to reach toward. But the oak treedness, the oak treeness is already within us. And this is now how I look at every single person that I meet, every single student. I look at them and this is the acorn. And what is my job? My job is to encourage, to nourish, and to provide something to get the oak treedness out from them or out to them. Right. So, back to the hospital room. So, the hospital nurse in the meantime, introduces himself as Tubela, okay? And so Tubela and I start chatting, and the three hours that I have to kill before the surgery just flies by, and eventually when the anesthetist walks in, I'm like amazed that it's time to go. So what is, what is Tubela and I talking about? Well, you know, we're talking about things. He's sharing with me that in his spare time, on the weekends, he works at a rural healthcare clinic, and there he, um, works with fathers and their children. And his life's mission is to change the mindset of these fathers who sometimes believes that children are women's business. Okay, like many fathers out there. Right, and he, his life's work is to change their mind. So we are talking about how to get people to change their mind, how to get people to thrive. And like I shared with him that day, I wanna share with you today one of the ways, one of the models that I use to bring in to bring uh, to my virtual teaching and it's a model called the thrive triangle and um, it was coined by Ariana Huffington uh, founder and CEO of Th thrive global and she's well known for the Huffington post she's a uh, part of the Huffington family so this thrive triangle it says that for a person to thrive and in my case I think about the student my student for that student to thrive they need three three things stimulation structure and recognition and using this model, this is what I bring into the virtual teaching world. And as you'll see, virtual teaching is not the same as online courses. Okay, it's not the same thing. Virtual teaching is an engagement. It's something different than online teaching. And I wanna share with you the way I bring these three things into the virtual teaching world. Firstly, let's talk about structure. Okay, so this busy slide, what is that all about? So I wanna, I wanna go back a little bit further. I told you what happened to me in 2018. So I wanna go back a year, year before that, 2017, I just started the business school. You know, I've been a lecturer on many courses in my life, but then I start my new job at uh, Stellenbosch Business School. Very excited. And the first thing they show me, show me is this, um, this platform. Um, it's a McGraw-Hill platform and it's got wonderful things on there. And they, they show me this, uh, this platform. Now remember, it's all accounting finance stuff. So on this wonderful platform, you can see some of the stuff that you can do there. Um, let me just go back. Okay, so you can see some of the stuff that you can do there. Um, you can get PowerPoint slides, you can build tests, you can do all kinds of things. Case studies, quizzes, um, the e it's, a, it's an online ebook. Um, now remember this for the, before the pandemic, right? So this is kind of cutting edge st stuff at the time. So you can do all things on this platform and I'm like, instead of being like amazed, I'm like filled with fear, right? Because I'm thinking like, okay, if all this stuff is available already, what am I supposed to do? Like, isn't that, isn't that what a lecturer does? Make slides, set tests, now everything is done for me. So what now, what will I do? Um, why don't they just record me and get on with it and fire all lecturers? And I'm sure that many lecturers, especially in this time, day and age, have been faced with the same fears. 
Well, now I understand that what we see here is just one part of the triangle, that structure. This is another page. Oh, sorry. Let me just go back there. Just another page, a page of this platform, Test Builder. Can you believe it? You can build a test. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it saves you a lot of time. Like I said, I was filled with fear initially. Um, these days, I realize that structure is very important. And I actually use a lot of tools, online tools, to help me with that. One of the things I use in the virtual teaching environment is I make sure that my students engage with pre-work. Right, so this is important to me. Pre-work, like you see this, uh, uh, this is one of the uh, lesson plans that I, that I make use of on our internal university system. And um, I give them videos to watch. I, like you can see, I, I make it um, very relevant. I never teach the same thing two years in a row. I always refresh my materials, as I'm sure you do. So they watch an activity, then they do the quizzes. But what's important here, it's not just about the structure, right? It's also another part of the triangle, and that's recognition. So I make sure to couple structure and pre-work with recognition. Why do I do that? Because it, I give, them an in, give my students an incentive to engage. I want my students, when they walk into the classroom, I want us all to be on the same page. Because the classroom is where the collective thinking, the collaboration will take place. For that to happen, they need to engage with the pre-work. So I make sure that I recognize them for their effort, either by giving them a class mark, or a completion mark, but I build that into my marking structure. I build that into the recognition. And that way I ensure complete engagement. Okay, so that's another thing that I use. Um, this is another example of some asynchronous content that I give. You know, people learn so fast these days. I've got a 15-year-old son, and um, believe it or not, he taught himself how to juggle from a YouTube video within three days. And I mean, he, can, he juggles. That's something we used to pay good money for when I was a kid to go into the circus, right? So what am I trying to say? People learn very fast these days. I've got another friend. She tells me her son just finished school. She says he doesn't want to go to university because why does he have to go to university where somebody tells him what he can read in a book anyway? <laughs> so gone are the days where we can just deliver content typical content. So what I've learned is I will take some of the more difficult concepts I will take out of the classroom. It sounds strange, right? But what I do is I make videos and I deliver them as asynchronous content so that I can keep the classroom available for discussion purposes, for collective thinking, right? Um, so classroom for me is about interaction, conceptualization, and connection. So my students love this. Why? Because it's still me. They know me from class. We've built up a relationship, right? But what they can do is afterwards or before class or whenever, they can watch this video. Sometimes they tell me they watch it at double or triple speed, right? And then they just go to the pieces where they, where they struggle with. So this is one of the ways that I make sure that I give them the full experience. Okay, so that's structure. Structure is important. Then stimulation. Now I want to share some good news with you. In terms of the stimulation part of the triangle, you are not alone. You, it, it's not just on you. So there's, a, there's the wonderful research by Whitman in 1988. So he coined uh, the phrase peer teaching. And this is something that every time I have a, a new group, this is the first thing I tell them. I tell them, it's not about me standing here and delivering a lecturer. It's about you learning from each other because this is the way adults learn learning from each other. And we use the, the peer teaching system. So I use that all the time. So what is peer teaching? Well, we, we can differentiate between co-peer co teaching and near peer teaching. Co-peer teaching is when we have two students or two people that have basically the same level of knowledge and they have a discussion. So they will talk about what, they've, what they understand something to be and it will be a back and forth. And in that way, there's a lot of learning that takes place. Near peer teaching is very similar, but then we have between two people, one that has slightly more knowledge. I find this a lot in my MBA classes. As you know, MBA uh, participants, uh, MBA students come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Sometimes I'll have the HR person or a liberal arts uh, person, and, some, and maybe there will be a finance person in class. So obviously the finance person is going to be slightly more comfortable in my class, right? So what I do when I set up groups for group work, and I do a lot of that, I will make sure that, that the group knows the following, that there is somebody that's more of a specialist in the group, and I will tell the rest of the group, you make sure that when you leave the session, 
that you've gotten all the information and all the knowledge from that guy. Make sure that he teaches you. Okay. So code peer teaching and near peer teaching works brilliantly. It actually works much better than studying from a textbook. The advantages of this, I mean, this is great stuff. So for the peer teacher, he, he deals cognitively with the concepts. So it's wonderful for him. He gets that application, that processing. And the peer learner, he gets a teacher that teaches him at the appropriate level. So it's, it's, it's really, it really works well. Okay, now what about tools? So whenever I talk about virtual lecturing, the first question that comes up is, what about all the tools? Do you have to have the bells and whistles? If you read my abstract, you'll, you'll see that I, that I spoke a little bit about tools there. So yes, I use tools, but never as the main meal. Always as a bit of an artifact, after, right. Tools, things that I use, I use things like, like you can see on screen, Blogger. Um, I use our platform to do forum discussions where students can engage. I even use Zoom. There's some cool, cool stuff on Zoom these days, like you can see over here. So, you know, you've probably used the function where you can do stamps. So this is just one of the examples that I use. Yes, so there's a lot of bells and whistles that, that you can use. But remember, in finance, we always talk about value. What is the value to the student? What is the value proposition? The value there is about collective thinking, collaboration, right? It's not about bells and whistles. So I always have the thinking in mind that it's, it's, it's about more than just the tools. If you just plan around the tools and the break times and the this and that, you lose some of the magic. Okay, sometimes I just do things on the fly. So I don't always plan ahead. And this, is, this was one of those days. So on this particular day, um, I had a guest speaker from a South African company. The South Africans listening will know Nando's. And I think there's actually um, quite a few abroad as well. So this picture in the background is actually from one of the UK Nando's, uh, Nando's uh, stores. So this, uh, the CEO, Mike Cathy, came to speak to, to one of my groups. And um, he had an amazing talk. People were absolutely enthralled. And so afterwards, I said to my students, you guys, um, let's, let's, let's put our thoughts somewhere. And I opened up a Padlet, it's a wonderful tool, and they put up their, their takeaways. And they could like each other's posts and things like that. I mean, it's a free tool, I use it all the time, it's wonderful. And what we did is, I, I sent this to Mr. Cathy, and he sent it to his staff, and they loved it. So again, a nice takeaway. And I also, what you could also do is, using Padlet, this was similar, this was for a, for a group that I was training. Also used the Padlet, but what, then what I did is I, I trained it into a PDF, and I emailed the PDF to these participants. So then I'm also building in not just stimulation, but recognition, recognition of their thoughts, recognition of the collaboration that took place. And they can then take this PDF, they've got a little takeaway, and they take that into their business and, and the thinking goes forward. So you can see I'm always thinking about my tri triangle. So, lastly, recognition. Um, for me, recognition is so much more than just about marks, okay, for a student. Recognition is about, again, taking a page from the coaching playbook. It's about being listened to, being heard. And one of the best ways that I know how to do that is by using Teams. I mean, I don't know Teams from scratch a year ago, but Teams is a wonderful thing. So what I do, every time I have a new group, I open up a Teams page, and I don't call it talk to the lecturer or contact the lecturer, I call it connect with me, Sonia, right? And what this is for, it's for me just sharing thoughts, like I share an article that I read in the newspaper, but students can also contact me, just give me a quick ping, you know, if they want to ask something real quick, not the long email. They can't find me in, in, in my, my office anymore because everything is virtual. So if they want to talk to me, I say connect through Teams, just send me a message. If a, a longer conversation is needed, we can set up a meeting. And I don't close this down once the classes are over. I leave it open. As long as they wanna stay on here and connect with me, even if it's years later, they can do that. Right, and we chat there and then we collaborate. It's fantastic. Also, in terms with my research students, I also use Teams. And I wanna, again, wanna bring the recognition principle in here. So I use Teams. So I've got a group of 10 research students this year, master students. And instead of dealing with them one by one, like I did in the past, we now have a team. So there's a sense of connection. But also the recognition that happens, if something happens, like here I was requesting a meeting. Right, so if I put my name on that sheet, 
and somebody else doesn't. I'm being recognized, right? So this is a way of getting them to engage. It works wonderfully. They share ideas, they share thoughts. So it's not just me in my ivory tower handing out assignments and due dates and criticisms. It's talking. It's when we do a group meeting, we record it. You can look at it ba back later. So again, recognizing the work they put in, the effort they put in. Okay, finally, thank you. I just want to thank you for having this, this conversation with me today. And I really hope that we'll be able to take this conversation further later today through, the, through lunch, if you're here, and also um, yeah, in the Q&A. Um, so it's all about, for me, it's all about the art of conversation, right? Um, starting in the ancient times with the likes of Cicero. Now, Cicero, let me read to you. He was a, not just a Roman statesman that he's known for. He was also a lawyer, hint, hint, a scholar, a philosopher, okay, and an acad academic skeptic. Okay. And he's standing on the Roman, uh, Roman plains, and he is enthroning his audiences. Okay. From that time to our time today, so if you read the intro, you, you heard that I was talking about radio, radio DJing. So I know a transgressor a little bit went to the hospital and came back to Cicero. But anyway, today, we still like to listen to conversations. Even there, we were driving in our car listening to the radio DJ. And I want to end off just by reading. I can't memorize all this stuff. Um, just by reading a piece of my, of my abstract to you. So this is what I, what I wrote. Just like the radio DJ captures their audience by enlivening the space, befriending their listener, and bringing their authentic self. So the virtual lecturer must meet their students wherever they find themselves, whether they are sitting on a bus with earphones plugged in, precariously balancing a notebook on their knee, or sitting propped up against some pillows. Get ready to have a conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>